The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, and I'm the Training Specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Prevention in Action, Investing in Healthy Families and Communities, with Casey Keene, who is the Director of Programs and Prevention with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, or or NRCDV. And Casey will be introducing themselves a bit more in just a moment. Um, but before we get started, let's go to the next slide. I'd like to share a little information with you. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. As many of you know, the APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. And we're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide. The APS TARC also presents monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, managers, and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of the month, and depending on which peer group you want to attend, um, registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Um, please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive the registration information, and we'll have a contact slide at the end of the webinar. Next slide. Now some high housekeeping. A handout of today's slide is available for download in the handout section of your web control panel. You may download them at any time. They have a lot of great links and resources, so I highly encourage you to download those. Please use your computer speakers to access audio and make sure that the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. And if you experience any audio problems due to an internet connection, we rep recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter or log back in. Next slide, please. We are planning to have time at the end of the panel discussion for questions and comments, but you may ask questions of our presenter at any time by typing them into the questions box in your webinar control panel. And we will try to get to as many as we can. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website at a later date, along with a copy of the slides, and we will notify everyone when it's posted online. And everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And when prompted, please also take our brief webinar survey. We really enjoy hearing your feedback. Now, before we get started with Casey, let's go ahead and get a sense of who is joining us today through a quick attendee poll. Which of the following do you identify the most with? So go ahead and make a selection. Gives us an idea who is in our audience today. Looks like our poll is up. And the voting started. All right, we'll have that this up for a few more seconds. So go ahead and make your make your selection. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll and see who we have. Okay, well, we have a lot of adult protective service professionals along with other social service professionals and a few others and some medical and legal professionals. Welcome everyone. If those of you who identified as other, if you wanna use the question box and let us know who you are, that would be awesome. And now let's go to the next slide. I. I'm going to hand it over with great pleasure to Casey Keene um, for our presentation. Take it away, Casey. Thank you so much, Krista. And I, I have to say, I'm so impressed. You told me five minutes for the intro slides and it was exactly on time. And hopefully I can be as on time as you are. I am so 
pleased to be here with all of you today. Um, thank you for inviting me into this space. I have so much gratitude for the work that you do here. And um, just to introduce myself a bit, um, I have been at the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence for 20 years in a number of different roles. And um, today I am the Director of Programs and Prevention on our Programs and Prevention team. Um, my passion for pre prevention really comes from a long history of trauma in my family across generations, um, my personal experiences of childhood domestic violence, um, and the fact that I love to imagine what is possible if we can really dig into those factors that promote healing and resilience and equity and justice. So just wanting to say that I'm especially excited to be here with you today. Um, because we know that cross movement and cross sector partnership is not only important to prevention, it's necessary um, that we do this work together. So very happy to be with you today. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I want to begin by sharing just a little bit about the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence work. Um, we provide free technical assistance, training, and resource development related to uh, domestic violence and intersecting issues. So please feel free to call on us as a resource um, if, if this is something that is of interest to you in advancing your work. Next slide. Our We Stand statement uh, grounds and guides all that we do here at NRCDV. Um, we uh, use this statement as an accountability tool to ensure that we are always centering those who are most impacted. And so I'm not going to read the full statement today, but I will highlight um, that we stand in celebration of the rich diversity of people in this country and the vitality and strength they bring to our communities and society, because that is such an important part of the prevention work that we do together. Next slide, please. There are a number of key initiatives and special projects that the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence hosts. And so just wanting to bring your attention to the variety of work that we do um, around uh, building evidence, uh, working with runaway and homeless youth, that's our RHY toolkit. We have our VaNet online resource library. Um, we uh, host the Domestic Violence Awareness Project. Um, we work on issues of housing and community-based participatory research. Um, ACEDV stands for Adult Children Exposed to Domestic Violence Leadership Forum. So we have a number of different projects, but the project that I'm here representing today um, is our Prevent IPV project. Um, and so I encourage you to check out uh, all of our different projects if you're interested in these topics and what they might bring to your work. Um, next slide, please. So for the Prevent IPV project, um, our mission, our goal is really to advance a unified national prevention agenda. And we have our website, preventipv.org, um, that I'll be sharing a little bit with you today of what the tools and resources are. Um, but it's really a place where we can uh, promote lessons learned across the country um, from prevention initiatives that are happening um, in states and in local communities, um, in tribal communities and territories all across the United States. Um, there is so much amazing prevention work happening. Um, and so we just want to be able to share all of that good work, learn from it and be able to adapt it in our own communities. Next slide, please. So we all know trauma well, at least we know it on an individual level, and we know that trauma changes us in profound ways. Um, I want to just frame today's uh, talk by saying that the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice has been and continues to be an experience of collective trauma that offers an opportunity to pivot. Uh, now more than ever, people have a new and deeper understanding of what trauma looks and feels like, and about the deep disparities that exist when it comes to impact. 
we have seen the impact of COVID on older populations exacerbated by the challenges of isolation, limited mobility, and access to preventive care. We have learned that older Black and Latinx people are more likely to die from COVID-19 than white people due to systemic inequity when it comes to fair housing markets, access to quality health care, and employment practices. And this culminates into increased risk uh, for comorbidities, exacerbating the risk of death when contracting COVID-19. Prior to COVID, uh, Older victims of crime and abuse experienced unique challenges and barriers to accessing healing and justice services. But this pandemic has exacerbated these barriers and created new challenges for older survivors, in addition to the added stress and trauma of being higher risk for contracting and suffering uh, with COVID-19. So the pandemic has revealed the dire consequences of unchecked systemic racism and ageism on older victims and survivors of abuse. So it's an opportunity now for us to ask, how has this pandemic changed us and our work? And who do we need to be going forward? What I would suggest is that this, this work requires us to pivot to prevention. Prevention is the thing we need right now. We are urged to shift our focus to community care, community organizing, health equity, and racial justice, just to name a few directions. This work is about changing the conditions that allow disparity and abuse to continue. Um, if you'd like, I really encourage you to share in the chat um, to keep this conversation going around what new opportunities you might see for shifting our work based on this new reality. For us, from where we sit, we see some really um, bold new directions emerging from the lessons that we are learning at this moment in time. Next slide, please. So what is prevention? At its core, prevention is social change. It's about getting at the root causes and the systems that reinforce them. This is broad level work, which means it encompasses everything. Um, and that fact makes prevention both easy because there are a million different options and directions that you could move the work forward in, but also really hard because it's hard to make the case about how these activities might be directly related to our mission and our goals. That's why making the case is a major part of what we do in the prevention field. Um, and in order to make the case, we really need to capture the impact of these efforts in order to build people's investment in them. Because prevention, as social change work, requires investment, and not just short-term investment, but long-term investment. This can be really challenging work when so much of it seems to be intangible. But we can demonstrate measurable outcomes of prevention in order to show that it truly is worth the investment. So next slide. So the social ecological model, um, if you're not familiar with it or haven't seen it before, is a public health prevention framework that helps us understand the contributing factors and root causes of abuse on the individual relationship, community, and societal level. Um, really an effective and comprehensive prevention approach happens across all levels of the social ecology. And at each level, we can identify and understand the range of factors that put people at risk for violence or protect them from experiencing or perpetrating violence. Prevention work aims to reduce or eliminate the risk factors while promoting the protective factors at each level. And so I'm gonna give some examples of what that might look like. Um, on the individual level, um, we might identify biology and personal history as factors that might increase the likelihood of becoming a victim or a perpetrator of violence. And those things might include age, education, income, history of abuse. Um, and prevention strategies at this level really are promoting um, changes in attitudes and beliefs and behaviors around violence. On the relationship level, 
um, we're looking at relationships that may increase the risk of experiencing violence um, as a victim or a perpetrator. So prevention strategies at this level may include parenting or family-focused prevention programs, um, mentoring, peer programs designed to strengthen parent-child communication or promote positive peer norms, um, and just really promoting healthy relationships. At the community level, we're really exploring this, the settings that we are in, such as schools and workplaces and neighborhoods, um, to identify the characteristics of these settings that are associated with becoming a victim or perpetrator of violence. So prevention strategies at this level are about improving the physical and social environment in these settings. So basically the, the, the safe, creating safe places for people to live, learn, work, play, worship, uh, love, and grow. Um, and so we can do this by addressing the conditions that give rise to violence in communities like neighborhood poverty, residential segregation and instability, um, things like that. Then there's the societal level. And this looks at the broad societal factors that help to create a climate in which violence is encouraged or inhibited. So this would include social and cultural norms, policies and practices that help maintain economic or social inequality, inequalities between groups and society. Um, at this level, prevention work focuses on strengthening household financial security, um, education and employment op opportunities, um, and other policies that affect the social uh, and structural determinants of health. And we'll talk more about that soon. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to show you um, just a, a portion of this video that helps to illustrate what risk and protective factors might look like. Um, so please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would encourage you to watch the rest, rest of this video to sort of see how these risk and protective factors for violence can impact our trajectory uh, for both abuse and resilience. And those links will, are available in the resource slide. Let's go to the next slide, please. So prevention focus us to, uh, forces us to shift the conversation from what we want to stop to what we want to achieve. It offers a new framework from the problem to the solution, um, from urgency in the immediate moment to the long road of future generations, from what feels impossible to what is possible. And we can help people draw those connections between our social change efforts and our organizational missions. Um, the Frameworks Institute offers really helpful guidance on how to shift this narrative. Um, and I know that you're familiar with some of their work around talking about elder abuse, um, where they encourage us to promote a sense of collective responsibility. Um, and we have drawn on their document, their resource that you can access in the links, uh, Reframing Childhood Adversity promoting upstream approaches, um, because it does that same kind of thing. It 
helps us make the shift um, to emphasize the solvable nature of the problems that we're looking to address and the fact that everyone has a part to play in that solution, hence the investment that we're looking for people to make. We need to be clear about our vision for the future. What would, what would the world look like? What would the lives of older people look like if we were to make the change that we want to see? And what does it take to get us there? So next slide, please. When we make that kind of a shift, what really becomes clear is that we are all working toward the same goal. We can and we must connect our work to other movements that have a shared horizon of the change that we wish to see. And so here are some examples of, uh, you know, uh, sister of uh, sister brother sibling organizations si sibling organizations and movements that have a similar goal to ours have a shared horizon around fostering healthy families and communities and this relationship building um, this meaningful collaboration is our work that is part of what prevention work is if we can work collaboratively as part of a larger social justice movement alongside those with aligned goals, then we can achieve the shift in the culture that will end the abuse. So I'd really encourage you to consider what would those collaborations look like for you? Who might you reach out to in your community and invite into your to the you know to your table? What spaces could you show up at? Where are the opportunities for you to build relationships with others who share that horizon? Next slide, please. So let's go back to the social determinants of health. These are the conditions in which people are born, live, work, age, worship, play, all of those things. Healthy People 2020 emphasizes the importance of addressing these to quote, create social and physical environments that promote good health for all. These things, education, economic stability, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and health and healthcare are the core building blocks of health and wellness. And these outcomes are emphasized in CDC's technical packages, which provide guidance on best practices for preventing many types of violence and abuse. You can get the link to where you can find CDC's te technical packages on the resource slide. Next slide, please. So here is where you will see how CDC has leveraged these social determinants of health as a foundation for their Delta Impact program. They address community and societal level risk and protective factors, those outermost layers of the social ecology. So the Delta Impact program, what it is, is it funds 10 state coalitions and their local coordinated community response teams to approach the work in this way. So I'm going to talk more about what a coordinated community response team is and why it's relevant. Um, the states that were funded for Delta Impact are Alaska, California, Delaware, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Tennessee. And these states are engaged in this work right now around these core focus areas that are modeled after those social determinants of health. So the first focus area, create protective environments. And that looks like uh, IPV in the workplace training. It looks like greening urban spaces. It looks like Air Force uh, suicide prevention programs. Um, in focus area two, engage influential adults and peers. We see examples of programs that are around coaching boys into men, uh, bringing in the bystander. Um, in focus area three, strengthening economic supports for families. Some program examples would be family assistance programs, uh, access to EITC and child tax credits, uh, collaboration with utility rights projects, Microfin microfinance programs, uh, paid leave policies and benefits, so things like that. So coordinated community response teams, what are they? These are really critical to the work. A coordinated community response team, or CCR, is an organized effort of diverse sectors, so public health, law enforcement, faith-based organizations, 
just people representing different sectors in the community to prevent and respond to intimate partner violence. And historically, these teams have really focused on providing services to victims, holding batterers accountable, and reducing the number of recurring assaults. And I understand that you have similar community-based teams um, as you do your work. However, few have concentrated on primary prevention. So what Delta Impact is doing is supporting these CCRs to use prevent primary prevention strategies that really affect the structural determinants of health at the societal or community levels, or in other words, those factors that influence where people live, work, and age. So a question for you to consider is how could you expand your existing multidisciplinary partnerships to support this kind of shift to prevention? Who might you invite to the table in order to make that happen? How could you expand the work of your existing multidisciplinary partnerships to include prevention as a component of its work? Um, it's something to consider. Next slide, please. Before Delta Impact, we had Delta Focus, and in fact, there have been many iterations of Delta funding that's come out of CDC. The Delta Focus program was developed to identify promising community and societal level prevention strategies, and this is also funded by CDC. The program funded state domestic 10 state domestic violence coalitions and 16 CCR teams for five years, so from 2013 to 2017, to implement and evaluate programs and policies to prevent IPV at those structural determinants of health. Um, the good news is, is that we have been able to work with CDC and the grantees to identify what were the lessons learned from this work so that we can then share those lessons with you and others who are interested in advancing prevention. So I'm going to share some of the high level lessons learned with you now. Next slide. So there were six overarching core lessons, um, and I'm hoping these will validate and reinforce what you already know. So number one, prevention work is broad and expansive. We talked about the fact that prevention really can encompass anything and everything. Um, Dina Fulton, one of, the, one of the grantees from North Carolina says, it was about broadening the settings and the systems we were working within. Um, Lucy Rio says, it includes efforts to build community cohesion. And Lauren Camphausen reflected on how it incorporates economic justice as a prevention approach in the broader community. Um, so really, it could be anything and everything that gets to, um, you know, really what those uh, structural determinants of health are. Next slide. Prevention work must be integrated into all that we do. Um, really, the reflection here is that works best when it's integrated and institutionalized across the organization and not just uh, delegated to, to one person's role. We all have a part to play, and we talked already about how important that investment is. On the organizational level, it's important that everybody sees the part they play in advancing prevention. Next slide. Community partnerships are critical to reaching our goals. We've also talked about this, how we need to partner across human service sectors. Um, we need to build uh, organizational relationships, relationships with organizations and not just individuals. Um, this is, this uh, meaningful relationship building is part of what's gonna advance our prevention work. Next slide. Prevention can and must be trauma-informed. So this is about the fact that we have to acknowledge that uh, there will be historical trauma for individuals, for communities, and that that's something we need to acknowledge going into this work. It used to be commonly thought that primary prevention was around working with people who had not ever experienced harm. We know so much now about the fact that um, about the harm that people do experience in their lives. And we know that prevention is broader than that. Next slide. Effective changes to policy and practice must include voices at all levels. And here, Emil is reflecting on how communication needs to flow in both directions. Next slide. 
prevention work is both challenging and fundamentally just. Um, you can see the, a reflection here from Colleen, who says it requires intentional leadership to center those who are most impacted. And this kind of a shift, as she points out, from a movement based on sharing information to one that shifts power is challenging work to do, but necessary because prevention, as we know, is social change. Next slide. So for each, um, so as an outcome of the Delta Focus um, lessons learned, um, there were seven stories created um, that are based on seven key themes uh, for the work. So you'll see engaging youth, engaging men and boys. For every uh, theme, you'll find a full story um, that describes uh, program examples and lessons learned and highlighted strategies. Um, we also lift up tools for adaptation. If this is the kind of work you want to do, um, how might you adapt it in your own community? Um, and we provide resources so that uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So let's look at a couple of program examples around youth engagement to give you an idea. Next slide. So the Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, as part of their work, asked high school students involved in violence prevention groups around Indiana to tell them what they needed to feel safe, stable, and nurtured in their communities. So a few of the things that the young people in Indiana said were they wanted to feel connected to their families and to their friends. They wanted to grow in environments that were free from physical dangers and also discrimination. They wanted to be able to rely on stable basics. So those things like housing and food security and transportation in order to be able to learn and thrive. And they wanted opportunities to learn and grow. So the Indiana Coalition collected this advice into an infographic that you're seeing here and you can see the full version um, through the link in the resource slide. Um, and it illustrates multiple areas of action that we can take to prevent forms of violence by increasing safe, safety, stability, and nurturance in the lives of all youth. They called this a treasure map, and it explores the following youth-defined prevention strategies, social, family, and organizational connectedness, support for personal growth, stable basics, safe nonviolent communities, and acceptance and inclusion. So in looking at this, there are so many different directions that the Indiana Coalition and that all of us can decide to focus our work on, but it starts with learning from the communities that we want to impact about what they need to, to be able to live uh, healthy, um happy lives and then moving in that direction with our prevention work so a question to consider here is what are the opportunities to connect these goals to outcomes uh, for your population of older adults um, and the next slide is going to show an example of a prevention campaign that i think makes a very clear link um, between the needs and and vision for the future of youth and the role that, um, that elders can play. So let's go to the next slide. So before we show the video, I'm gonna introduce this by saying that this is a PSA series that was developed by youth in Alaska, sharing their vision for their community when they are an elder. And it's called, When I Am an Elder. Um, the goal of developing this material was to create a way to share a holistic approach to community and individual wellness that includes a world without violence. Um, this approach to developing the PSAs was collaborative um, with youth and resulted in this compelling message within Alaska for Native and non-Native audiences, youth and adults. It captures the real ideas and words of Alaska youth. Um, so let's take a moment to watch this video and then I'll share with you what they gathered in terms of what the impact was of this campaign. Please go ahead.
So again, that's the When I'm an Elder campaign um, developed by the Alaska Coalition. And um, they uh, took some care in measuring the impact of this campaign on their community, um, starting with a qualitative evaluation um, after the first round of PSAs were released. And what they found was that many people recalled the messages, um, they shared how they felt moved by them, and this was the best indicator they had was that there were a number of communities interested who started coming out uh, and requesting to partner with the Alaska Coalition on the project to have their own cultural group groups represented in the project. So people were interested in investing in this campaign um, as a strategy to promote um, you know, youth's ideas for the future um, and what they wanted to see in their communities. So I consider using a strategy like this to engage your community in cross-generational dialogue um, that could potentially be led by youth. Uh, this approach can be used to engage young people, uh, build leadership skills and help raise awareness um, during Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month, for example, and even during Elder Abuse Awareness Month. Um, the Alaska Coalition used a particular process to engage youth, organizations, and community during the production, the filming, and the release of these PSAs. And collaboration and coalition building was so that was so necessary to the process um, and is what allowed them to create such a powerful message. Um, so it's all about cultivating those partnerships with youth, local programs, tribal organizations, media partners, in order to develop these genuine messages um, and really humanize the ideas um, of our prevention work in action. Let's go to the next slide. So as we said before, prevention invites us to shift the focus from where what we want to stop to what we want to achieve. There are so many ways to get there. So the questions are then for you, what does your community need and how can you help open that door? How do your existing programs support the goal of building healthy families and communities? And are there pathways you maybe haven't considered? Let's go to the next slide. So I'd like to talk briefly about um, promoting individual and community resilience as a prevention strategy. So as you're thinking about what shape your prevention work takes, um, we have found that there are three constructs that uh, we've come across in the research that are shown to be scientific, scientifically connected to well-being. And those things are hope, mattering, and justice. These things are measurable which means that if you can create change in these areas, you can demonstrate impact. Let's start with hope. Next slide. So hope is, uh, in the book Hope Rising by Casey Gwynn and Chan Hellman, they explore hope as a science. Um, and in every published study about hope, they found that it's single, it is the single best predictor of well-being compared to any other measures of trauma recovery. If we can help people and communities build willpower, which is agency, and identify way power, which is the pathways to get there, then we can foster hope. And if we can foster hope, then we can enhance well-being. Let's go to the next slide. Another component is mattering, something that's measurable. Uh, Dr. Isaac Prilitensky of the University of Miami researches the science of mattering and says that it boils down to two essential components, feeling valued and adding value. In our lives, we come to feel that we matter through our experiences of both deriving value from and adding value to ourselves, our relationships, and our community. And it is that reciprocal relationship that allows us to feel truly connected. And that's an important protective factor when it comes to prevention. Next slide. And last, justice. 
Um, we've long known this, that as advocates for social justice, that justice is critical on the path to healing. Um, in other words, if there's no fairness in the way that we treat ourselves, the way we treat others, and our position in the community, then there's no wellness. So advancing justice is prevention work. So let's go to the next slide. I'd like to show this brief video um, about uh, this program called Greenhouse 17. It's an example of a program that works to build both individual and community resilience. They're based in rural Fayette County, Kentucky, surrounded by 40 acres of land, and they farm this land to offer nature-based healing, uh, field-to-table produce, and job training for survivors. So let's take a look. Thank you so much. Um, I really love to show this video. And if you're interested in watching the full video, again, you know, go ahead and click the link in the resource slides. Um, but I think it's a great example of programming that really is intentional about integrating prevention and inter intervention. Um, as we said, prevention is something that needs to be incorporated across programs. It's not a separate thing. Um, and so what this does uh, is it really embodies what we just talked about when it comes to hope and mattering, um, it really gets at some of those uh, social determinants of health. Um, it, 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 it does greening spaces while also building um, autonomy um, and skills uh, for survivors. So I encourage you to think about how might you implement similar strategies in your work or what things are you already doing um, that really do advance prevention in these kinds of ways. So let's go to the next slide. So in order to prove that your prevention efforts are making an impact, you really need to start with the theory of change. And a theory of change is if we action in order to goals, we expect outcome. And once you lay that out, then you have something to measure it against. So I'll give you an example. At NRCDV, our theory of change is 
if we center the lived experiences of survivors of color in order to end systemic racism, we will attain safe and thriving communities. So let me read that again. If we, the action is center the lived experiences of survivors of color in order to end systemic racism as our goal, we will, or we expect, that we'll attain safe and thriving communities. So we can talk maybe another time, uh, dig more deeply into what that looks like to create these theories of change and then measure your prevention work against them. But as a starting point um, for our prevention work, it's important to start with our intention. Um, and then we can go back and look at whether we've made progress toward that goal. Let's go to the next slide. So consider your current activities. Can you connect them to the outcomes that you might identify here? Um, so what kinds of outcomes do you want for your community? Do you want racial equity? Do you want health and safety? Do you want resilience, economic stability? Um, in what ways could you pivot your programs and pivot your work so that your desired outcomes more closely align? Who are you going to invite in? Who will your partners be? Who can you invite to your multidisciplinary response team in service of this shift to get to these outcomes that you've identified? Just food for thought as you think about advancing your prevention work. So let's go to the next slide and we're gonna wrap up um, and leave some time for questions. So hopefully you're thinking about those questions. Um, so I want to share with you the preventipv.org um, website resource. Um, and so this is what the website looks like. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we have information about what prevention is, um, what the key resources are in terms of helping us to all understand IPV prevention as social change work. Next slide. We have resources on making the case. Um, when it comes to prevention. So how do you make the case to partners in business and policy? How do you make the case to community partners? How do you make the case to our allies in health and wellness and social justice? And how do we make the case within our own movements and organizations? We give examples of how to do that. Next slide. This shows what one of our um, Delta focused stories looks like. This is the one on youth engagement. So you can access all of those lessons learned um, and resources for implementation there. Next slide. We also have a number of tools in our tools inventory that are all examples of um, prevention campaigns and projects that are happening across the country. And next slide. You can also find evidence to support your practice. So building evidence is an important focus of our work and you can search our tools inventory for those evidence-based practices. So I think, yeah, if we go to the next slide, we've got the resources that we talked about today and I encourage you to dig in to all of those. Um, and I think if we just advance the slide, we're going to be moving toward questions. And Krista, it seems like I may have gotten the timing just right. <laughs> you did. You did, considering <laughs> how much information you just shared with us. That was pretty amazing. So thank you, Casey. <laughs> It's a, a lot of really, really great information. So um, next slide. So now is time for your uh, questions and oh, and there's some very good contact information for NRCDV. Um, yes, and I really do encourage anyone who's interested in building their capacity around prevention um, to please reach out to us. We're very happy to support your work. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I think as we're waiting for some folks to, you know, share some comments and some questions, I, I just am thinking, so I know that those of us who work in APS and to support APS, we live a lot in the realm of intervention and not so much in prevention. So this is a bit of a, um, a, f a framing shift, I think, for all of us. So I'm, I'm continuing to kind of take it in and, and was appreciating your prompting thinking questions about what that would look like. Um, in general, given given your experiences um, and some of the resources on, on the website, who would you recommend?
recommend that APS, the APS um, programs that do work with uh, MDTs or multidisciplinary teams, if they're not already kind of breaking down the silos around prevention, who, who would be like the first email or the first call that you would make uh, for them? So say, you know, the, the, it's more of a tradition, the traditional MDT um, and they're wanting to kind of move a little bit into the prevention mode. So, Krista, that's a great question. Are you asking who, you know, who they might, who they might reach out to, to brainstorm potential partners or what their first partners to call into the space might be? I would say the, the, the latter, that who would be the first partner okay. to call into the space? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a really great question. And I'm glad. I do think that this does require us to all sort of stretch and shift outside of what we're used to. Um, I think that really it starts with what your goals and outcomes are from, you know, your prevention work and then identifying who in the community is also working toward that goal. So when we think about that shared horizon, right, and um, who in the community is doing that work, um, that's who we want to call in. Um, and in fact, um, you know, it, it, I, I would say it, the reciprocal relationship building is really important. So more than what can you do for me when I invite you into my space, but what can I do to help advance your efforts? Um, so really wanting to build those reciprocal and meaningful relationships with community partners. So if your goals are around um, resilience, I would be looking at who's doing resilience work in your community. Um, there are groups who are really focused on building community resilience that are based all across uh, the country. Um, uh, they're called PACES groups, and so that might be a starting point. If you're focused on racial equity, look to see who the community organizers are in your community who are leading that work. Um, who are the the you know organizations and individuals who are providing leadership uh, to that work and those are the people to reach out to um and those are the people whose work we need to be supporting as well so i don't know if that's a, if that answers your question but that's really where i would begin great no no it does definitely thank you casey and we did have a question come in um okay from a social worker um so we they have considerable difficulties when it comes to investigating a case involving domestic violence and mental health and COVID 19 has definitely made these conditions more challenging in the last couple of years in addition to community social and economic initiatives what focus does nrcdb have on prevention with a focus on mental health issues oh Oh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you so much for that. Mm. So I do think that mental health and mental well-being is, is a very critical component of our prevention work. Apologies, my kiddo is walking in the door from school. Hey, honey. Hi. Um, so I do think that it's a huge, uh, a hugely important focus. What we're talking about is promoting well-being for people, right? That well-being is the work of prevention. And so both on an individual and a community level, um, we need to be investing in uh, mental well-being. But I'm not sure that that really speaks, that really addresses the question that you're asking here. Krista, help me understand it if, it, if I'm not addressing it in the way it was intended um domestic yeah. violence, is it about the intersections between domestic violence and mental health yeah i think i think so that's that's why that's how i'm interpreting it as well so okay yeah yeah i mean I, I would invite this, you know, the person asking the question to please reach out um, so that we can provide a fuller response um, That's through, our technical, through our technical assistance. But uh, because I think what you're asking here is so many layers. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely we, we explore that intersection with our prevention work and also with our intervention work. I mean, it's all related. Um, 
So I think supporting mental well-being is so hugely important, not just for those who've experienced abuse, but also for those who cause harm. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I think we have time for one more question. So um, how can a public awareness campaign incorporate some of what was discussed today? And if that's too broad, um, you can punt that one. <laughs> No, I really think that is a, a major vehicle for communicating some of the messaging that we were talking about. Um, you know, certainly awareness is a big uh, piece of it, but when it comes to prevention, you know, it's social change work. So we're not only wanting to raise awareness, but we're wanting to move people to action. And actually our domestic violence awareness project, I think, um, is a great example of making this intentional shift. Um, we have a, a number of different messages that we promote uh, during Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but one of the critical ones has been awareness plus action equals social change. And so when we um, design our awareness campaigns with these core messages around prevention, whatever they are, and it could be anything and everything, um, we need to be very mindful about putting out also a call to action, um, asking people to do something um, to be part of the solution. And when we talked about sort of shifting the focus, we talked about, you know, the importance of building that investment in our prevention work. And so I do think that these awareness campaigns are hugely important um, and that the the a big piece of that is the ask is the what will you do and another example from our domestic violence awareness project is our hashtag one thing campaign where we invite people to do one thing we invite people to think about what's your one thing that you're going to do to advance social change in this direction so I guess that would be my answer. Yes, yes, yes. Awareness campaigns that are coupled with a call to tangible action. And that's something that you can measure to show the impact of your prevention work. Great. Kind of like you were talking about the Alaska, the Alaska Coalition actually ended up measuring um, some of the, the results from their um, their PSAs as well. So. That was exactly. an example that you just gave, great. Yep, and I will say too that CDC is very um, focused on evaluating prevention programs and has lots of amazing tools. So if anybody needs support around evaluation, we're happy to provide that. Great, and then we have uh, one other question that came in, it will be our last question. Not sure if this was mentioned already, for APS dealing with elders, the definition of domestic violence goes beyond just the spouse. When trying to prevent further DV abuse, does your agency have resources that specifically target assist elders and their family? So yes. this would be in the intervention realm. Yeah, and I mean, I think that we, it also does incorporate uh, prevention, right? Um, because we want to prevent further harm. I mean, that's a, a major goal of ours. Yes, we absolutely have amazing resources that are targeted um, to older adults who have experienced abuse and their families. Um, and I could provide um, some resources um, after we close here today. Great, thank you. Um, and great, thank you. And there's some appreciation for the mental health question. Okay, well, oh, good. Great. yeah, no, it's great. Thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you, Casey. This was, I know you and your team puts a, a huge amount of work into all of these resources and we so appreciate it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I wanna thank um, our TARC team and Andrew Capehart for uh, doing all the videos and the slides without a hitch. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. 
today. Um, really, really appreciate your participation and being with us. Happy early holidays. We look forward to seeing you in the new year and watch out for future webinar announcements coming soon. Some of the topics we are working on for the early months of 2022, things like trauma-informed supervision and consumer-directed caregiving. So lots of exciting stuff to come. So thank you very much and we will uh, bid you adieu for today. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.